Good morning everyone, my name is Brendan Horan, I'm a dairy systems researcher here with Chagas based at Moore Park. On my left is Lawrence Chalou, who's an environmental modeller looking at emissions and so on. Our board this morning is looking at sustainability and the sustainability credentials of the Irish dairy industry. An area that's not without comment internationally in terms of, I suppose, look, where do, where do we place in terms of food production and how sustainable is our production system in comparison with others that we might compare with. So for the next 10 minutes we're just going to unfold that a little bit. We're beginning by looking at the four pillars of sustainability. Okay, there are four things we need to consider if we're going to judge any industry in terms of food production. Those are, one, how profitable is it for primary producers, for farmers to, you know, make a living at it. Envi what's the environmental impact of it in terms of its intensity, its footprint, its impact on the natural environment? What's the social implications of it? What's it like in terms of its treatment of animals, in terms of the workload for people working in the systems, as examples? And finally then, in terms of product quality. So we've listed these four areas up here, and we're going to look at how does Irish dairy compare in terms of other industries, in terms of that footprint, in terms of sustainability. So in terms of financials on the left-hand side, well, Irish dairy farmers are among the most profitable in Europe. That's based on our pasture-based system and our low costs of milk production. Okay, that's been a trend for many, many years, and it's continuing. So in terms of the first metric, we're giving ourselves a big tick there. We're doing really, really well. In terms of environmental sustainability, then, we're, we're asking questions like, well, how intensive is our production system? And actually, Ireland, in comparison with other uh, countries, our, our intensity of agricultural production is right in the middle of the EU. We are not more intensive than anyone else that we might compare with. Indeed, in terms of our emissions, our emissions footprint in terms of every kilo of milk produced, ammonia emissions, we know that it's among the lowest in the EU. We know that our grass-based systems support much higher levels of biodiversity than anyone we might compare ourselves with, so better habitats for wildlife and so on, and because of our climate then, much lower requirement for water use. So in terms of those sustainability indicators, we're doing pretty well on those as well. In terms of the social ones then, in terms of animal welfare for example, you know, you look at the levels of antibiotic use in Irish dairy systems in comparison with other countries, you'd look at, I suppose, the workload in terms of hours being put in per, per, per person on farms. And again, there again, any international comparison we do, we compare very favourably with. We have very low levels of antibiotic use, animals at grazing over long seasons and so on supports a much more uh, favourable system and so on. The last one in terms of product quality, in terms of both the nutrient value, Irish dairy products are high quality, low emissions products. Okay, so, and that's what's been sought internationally. So in terms of their nutritional value, their safety, and indeed even their colour, texture and so on, because of the fact that it's produced in pasture, it is entirely different to most of the milk that's been produced in the world. Just to show you what that, the impact of that, we know that internationally about 25% of all the protein requirements for humans comes from dairy industries worldwide. And about 50 to 60% of the calcium requirements for the human population is coming from dairy. But how does a grass-based system differ in terms of producing nutrition for humans? This is a French study that was completed a number of years ago and it just looks at, I suppose, the standard TMR system here on the left-hand side. One characteristic of that TMR system is that Really in a TMR system, whatever protein you're putting into those animals' diets, largely you're recovering one for one protein that's edible to humans coming out of that system in milk. So there's no net gain in terms of protein efficiency in a TMR system. You're just really using ruminants to create a different form of, of protein. The same study compared with grass-based sectors and it showed that actually if you use grass-based system because you're using more forage and less grains, okay, grains that are potentially edible by humans directly, you could increase the protein efficiency from one to about two and a half times. So two and a half times more efficient to produce and recover protein in a grazing system. In fact, a PhD student, Donna Hennessy at Moorpark, has redone this analysis now for Ireland and shown that actually in an Irish context, because we're the extreme version of this grazing system, it's actually four times the recovery of protein in a grazing system to compared with that international milk that's been produced on grains that are edible by humans. So really advantageous in terms of producing high quality food from a pasture diet. So, in terms of, I suppose, sustainability, we're saying we're actually comparing very favourably if you compare with any other dairy production system anywhere else in the world. Okay, and that stands up in terms of those metrics. But equally, we have to consider that climate is changing. There's a study released in the last couple of months from Cornell University that showed that actually total agricultural productivity in the world has been reduced now by 20% because of climate change. Now, we're not the US, we're not Australia, we're not countries that are being ravaged by climate change. But nonetheless, you would be foolish to think that climate change isn't affecting what's happening on your farms. 
These are Irish climate stripes, which are shown. Every stripe represents one year from 1900 right through to 2020. And that shows, you can see, when the colour is blue, it's a colder than average year. When it's red, it's a warmer than average year. We've been through almost 20 years now of consecutively warmer temperatures. In the last two generations, from your grandparents to the present day, the temperature which we're farming in has gone up by 0.9 of degree for Irish dairy farms. Now you'd say, okay, that's not a big deal, okay, could we, we can live with that, it's going to warm the soils and so on, grow more grass, but the indications from the modelling that's been done is that you're going to see an increase in winter rainfall across our, our system. So we're going to see that increase by between 5 and 19% heavy precipitation events modelled for Ireland based on the change in climate. In fact, we're already seeing that. Total rainfall on, on Irish uh, farms now has gone up by 8% since the 1980s. So we're already seeing the impacts of this. Probably of more significance in the south and east and where most of the dairy is, we're going to see much more seasonal distribution of rain with more winter rainfall and much less summer rainfall. So drought frequency, low dry matter production because of soil moisture deficits and so on, is becoming increasingly apparent on our dairy farms and that's going to be an increasing trend for the future. Why am I mentioning that? I'm mentioning that because when we think of these sustainability metrics, if we do nothing different today in the future to what we're doing today, it will become more difficult to maintain that level of sustainability just because of climate change. Okay? If you have drier summers, you have less water flooding to our streams, higher nitrogen concentrations, it challenges biodiversity and it, it's much more difficult to maintain these metrics. So we have, to, we have two choices. We can either be victims of that change or we can adapt to it. Okay, and what are the adaptions that we can reasonably take on that are still going to allow us to be very profitable to meet all these criteria that we have up here? In terms of the two big issues of the day, I suppose, there's two big ones in front of us, not least the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In the next couple of months, each sector of the economy is going to have to face up to a carbon budget. Okay? Agriculture is going to have to play its part in terms of that carbon budget, and it's going to be required to reduce total carbon emissions. In terms of Ireland, I suppose, and where we are today, we know we have a low footprint of milk production, roughly one kilo of CO2 equivalent per kilo of milk. That's really, really good by international standards. But we also know, based on the technology that's in this field this morning, that we can drop that down as low as 0 0.7, 0 0.73 kilos of CO2 per kilo of milk. What's the significance of that? That means that your farms can be at half the footprint of milk produced anywhere else in Europe, or at about one-sixth, one-seventh of the footprint of global milk production. Okay? We need the food. Every one of the reports that have been issued now is saying we need no loss in food production globally. It's all needed, and I've mentioned already how important dairy is to it. So if it's not going to be produced in these kinds of systems based on that kind of intensity of production, then where is it going to come from? So that's the challenge for us and the difficult choices before us. The other important characteristic of the Irish uh, dairy industry is that about two-thirds of our total emissions are enteric fermentation, methane. Okay, so methane, we know, the science is changing on that. It's a flow gas. Over 10 years, it's largely eliminated from the atmosphere. Okay, so the warming effect of it is very large initially, but then over time, it's re greatly reduced. We're doing a lot of work now, and you're going to see some of the benefits of that today, looking at manipulating diets, breeding better animals, um, looking at, I suppose, ways to reduce those emissions factors. And I suppose this is an emerging area and we, you know, we're using emissions factors that haven't been tested in grazing systems and as we've started to look at some of those we're starting to see that some of those emissions factors aren't actually accurate. So that I suppose that I, I would see this area opening up in the next few years and that methane, this, the, the difference that methane is in comparison to other warming gases is going to be really, really important. And one thing that all environmental, uh, I suppose, scientists agree on is that globally we can't use methane to solve our global warming crisis. Okay, so carbon dioxide is the main cause of climate change and we have to reduce carbon dioxide. In terms of methane, we're going to have to manage it too. We're certainly going to have to curtail methane production as part of that overall climate budget, but it is a different grass and that has to be reflected in all policy outcomes going forward. The other piece of the jigsaw that's currently missing and that we need to account for is carbon sequestration. So whether it's those grasslands that we're standing on today, how much are they sequestering, or the hedgerows indeed that you see around the site, how much are, you're getting no credit for those today, but there's a huge amount of work going on to quantify exactly how much carbon is being stored in your soils every year and that has been taken out of the system and to get value for that in terms of the inventory. So I'd say that's an open space and something that we're going to have to work on. The other big one that's coming up is water quality and I suppose look in terms of water quality trends I've represented them up here at the top of the graph basically in terms of the green areas at the left hand side of the graph so that's showing you from 1987 the bottom bar 
to 2020 at the top bar. And what you'll see is basically green areas are high and good status waters. Approximately 50-55% of Irish water quality is in good ecological status over the last, since 1987. There was a period where it was really good in 2013-2012. It was at its highest level. Almost 60% of water bodies were in really good ecological status. And then there was a decline in 2013 to 15, right through to 18. Indeed, the last report has just been released in 2021 shows a, a slight improvement again in ecological status of waters. Okay. That water body status today would set us at about ninth in the EU in terms of water quality, in terms of ecological status. So, look, we're not in a bad place in terms of an EU comparison, but there's, I suppose the target is that all water bodies would achieve good status by 2027. So that's quite an ambitious target set out in front of us. In terms of agriculture, we have to be pragmatic about it. Okay, agriculture is a significant pressure on water quality. We're seeing now that about 38% of water bodies, and these are largely located in the south and east, we're seeing rising nitrate concentrations in those water bodies. And a large part of that is coming from land use and agriculture. Okay? So we have to reduce the nutrient losses from agriculture to meet these water quality standards. The good news for you today looking at this is the science is pretty well proven in terms of how to reduce water quality loss from agriculture. And this is going to keep popping up today, this nitrogen surplus. The nitrogen surplus in a system is basically how much nitrogen is going into the system in the form of feed and fertilizer and how much has been recovered out the other side of the system, largely on your farms in terms of milk and also in terms of meat sales. If you can reduce the surplus, the amount that's going into the system, I suppose over and above what's coming out, that's the opportunity that's on your farms in terms of reducing the nitrogen impact, the nitrogen and nitrogen loss pathways. So that's really, really important. And I suppose the technologies to do that are what we're going to talk about next. The good news, I suppose, in terms of meeting these challenges is that what's going to be required to improve our emissions intensity is also what's largely required to improve water quality standards. So these technologies here listed up on our, the right hand side are the technologies we want to see adapted fully across all of our farms and relatively quickly. Okay, uh, I suppose the, the, the first point I have up there is the level and rate are both important. So I know everyone here is familiar with these technologies, protected urea, improving soil fertility, getting clover into our swords. And I think every farmer now is, you know, putting their toe in the water, testing out some of these things, using it on their farms. You know, if you're in derogation, you're being asked to do that anyway. But I suppose the one thing that you need to bear in mind is the rate at which you adopt those technologies is really, really important. If you adopt, you know, fully protected urea, for example, in 2022, we get credit for that all the way through to 2030. That then will work against any carbon budget that we have to meet as an industry. If you don't adopt that protected urea, you know, at a very low level or a modest level, and, you know, you don't really adopt it until 2028 or 29, that makes a huge difference in terms of the total impacts. So for technologies that we know to work, including protected urea, low emission slurry spreading methods, clover in our swords and so on. We need dairy farmers who we know are savvy around technology adoption and so on. We need you to start adopting those really quickly to get credit for those in terms of our inventories and to reduce some of the pressures in terms of meeting that overall agricultural sector emissions. Some of the other ones then in terms of, I suppose, reducing crude protein concentrate in concentrate and also total concentrate use. The more we rely on grass and the more we reduce the crude protein content in our feeds, the better our nitrogen surplus will be and then there's a whole stream of genetic ones down here at the bottom so whether it's lifting the EBI of your herd faster we know that will be both profitable for you to do and also reduce the intensity of emissions from your anim your, your herd using more sex semen to reduce the number of animals that are being bred to dairy and then in consequence using more dairy beef across your farms to create more beef better quality beef animals that would be more attractive for buyers in terms of the beef sector. Why, is it, why are we talking with dairy farmers about that? Because we know that if we could get more beef produced in Ireland from dairy farms rather than from you know pure suckler beef farms, then that would represent a 30% reduction in emissions associated with beef. A huge opportunity, an apple there for us to gain in terms of the overall agricultural carbon footprint. So look, these are the technologies. They're going to be unwrapped much more as you go around today. I suppose we're really about uh, introducing them. In terms of the, I suppose, the main messages we'd like you to take from this first board. The first one is, if we look overall at sustainability and look at it in terms of its component parts, the Irish dairy industry today actually stacks up very well in comparison with other industries we compare worldwide. The question is, you know, we need the food. If the food can't be produced in these low intensity and efficient grazing systems, where is it going to come from? 
Okay, so that's really the challenge to put back. In terms of, I suppose, knowing your numbers, you know, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions inventories now, it's coming through your milk checks, or whether it's coming through carbon, um, you know, the carbon uh, analysis going on in your farms through the Bore B audits, nit nitrogen surpluses, which will be coming to you now from now on in terms of, I suppose, reporting that for your individual farms. You need to know your numbers, and that's the way you will plan improvements and what you can achieve on your farm. The speed at which you adapt these technologies is going to be critically important for this industry to stave off some of the more, I think, crude kind of approaches in terms of regulation for the overall budgets. Methane is going to be a big one in terms of how we handle that as an, as an industry. I suppose there is an opportunity there, though, in terms of methane that, you know, by adopting the new methodologies such as the GWP star and so on that you'll hear about later, that that will offer us an opportunity going forward. Like any challenge, these environmental challenges seem, you know, they can seem quite grave, but that presents opportunity for those that adopt the fastest. So keep that in mind. Just like any challenge you face as a sector, and there have been many, that the quicker you adopt, the more opportunity that will arise from this. And then finally, we're going to, have to, we're going to need good sound policies around, science-based policies around to support agriculture in terms of the choices we make going forward in terms of nitrates directives, in terms of cap and so on, to support, I suppose, you know, profitable, uh, low-intensity uh, agricultural production from Ireland um, and high-quality products. So look, that's, that's our, I suppose, uh, overview of where we are in terms of sustainability. Like to